welcome to Physics 100. I am Professor Curtis, your instructor for this course, and this is the lecture for Chapter 29, Light Waves. Let's get started. Start out with, we're going to look at a Dutch mathematician and physicist named Christian Huygens, and he was the leading scientist of his day back in the 17th century. He showed that every point of a wave front may be considered the source of secondary waves that are spreading out in all directions, with a speed equal to the speed of a propagation. So we have a source point there, and it's putting out wave fronts in every direction around it, and each of those wave fronts is, a, is like a separate waveform, and they all have a, the same speed. They're all propagating at the same rate. So what this translates into is that every point on a wave behaves as if it's a new source for circular waves. So each of those points on the wavefront can become a point source to produce more waves out and out into the uh, further out. So all the waves will be traveling at the same speed, so that means they have the same frequency and the same wavelength. So the way this works is, if let's say we're going to generate plane waves by dipping a straight edge into water, and then we're going to move the water back and forth through a narrow opening. So we've got water sloshing up and down uh, from the straight edge, but then when those wave fronts meet the opening, that opening then serves as a point source for new waves that come through the barrier. This brings us back to the, the point of diffraction. That Remember earlier when we talked about dispersion, we have bending of light waves, and it's being refracted inside a prism, but different wavelengths will bend differently at different angles, and so we get a separation of the colors. Well, we get a similar effect with diffraction, which is the bending of light in ways that are other than reflection or refraction. So the light will bend as it passes the edge of an object to go through an aperture. So if we have a really small opening, the light will bend as it goes past the edges of that opening, and we can get the same effect that we saw with the prisms. The smaller the opening, the greater the diffraction effect. So here we have an example where we're looking at, say, waves on the water, and notice how the waves before they go through the narrow opening, okay, they're coming through in all sorts of different directions, but then that opening serves as a point source for new waves that get formed out past it. If we take that opening and we narrow it further, notice what happens to the wave pattern on the other side. We can narrow it even further, and again, notice the differences in the wave pattern. So, again, the smaller the opening, the greater the diffraction effect that we see on the other side. Light will pass through openings of different widths. So if the width of our window that we're passing our light through is large compared with the wavelength of the light, then there's going to be a sharp boundary uh, produced with the image between light and, sharp and dark areas. However, if the opening is small when you compare it with the wavelength, then the light is going to diffract, and you get that bending effect, and so the image that you produce there on the other side, the boundaries between light and dark areas become less well-defined because of that diffraction effect. We can see diffraction in all sorts of different shadows, so if you have a light that has only one color in it, so it's all got the same wavelength, it's not white light that's got everything in it, it's just one color, one wavelength. So you can get and put that through a uh, diffraction grating, so a very small slit there, and then you can get a diffraction pattern uh, of actual rings that are actually produced called diffraction rings. Now when you use white light, instead of monochromatic light, then the fringes merge to create the blurred image, uh, the blurred edges of our shadow. Okay, so if you want to sharpen that up, okay, then it's going to be really hard to do because even the sharpest shadow is blurred slightly at the edge because of this diffraction effect. 
Let's go back and look at what we've seen before with waveforms where we're talking about superposition. So remember how we get interference of waves depending upon how we're adding them together. So if the two waves interact to produce a resultant wave, that's what we call interference. And there's different types of interference, okay? So we can see reinforcement from constructive interference, or we can see cancellation from destructive interference, or we can get somewhere in between. So we get a sort of a partial cancellation between the two waveforms. And it just depends on whether they're in phase, so that they get fully reinforced, or if they're out of phase, in which we get some effect of cancellation. Of course, 180 degrees out of phase gives us total cancellation. Now, according to the principle of superposition, you're going to add those waveforms together when the two waves interact. So the amplitude of the resulting wave is the sum of the amplitude of the two individual waves. That's how we get reinforcement or cancellation. Well, let's apply this to, say, water waves. So we get interference from two different sources. So now we've got two different waveforms, two point sources, and the wave patterns that are going to form are going to interfere with each other. So the number of areas of constructive and destructive interference and the size of that interference depends on the length of the wave and the distance between the point sources. So if I look at, say, two point sources here in water, and I make waves in the water, Notice the interference pattern that's produced. Well, if we take and we look at, say, an area of constructive interference, that's going to be, say, like the light areas that you see there. And then the adjacent dark areas are going to be areas of destructive interference. And then partial interference will be somewhere in between. So the boundaries between those light and dark rings is going to be areas of partial interference. We also see partial interference here as it extends out as the waveforms are colliding with each other. So what happens if we take those point sources there in the water and we separate it out? Well, notice what happens with the interference pattern. Okay, We get more areas of interference the further out those point sources are. So with that in mind, go ahead and take a moment there in your workbook, work out this activity. We're going to look at identifying areas of constructive interference, destructive interference, and partial interference. So go ahead and stop the video and take a moment to identify which type of interference do we have at each of those five points there in the image. And then when you get done with that, come back and we'll see how well you did. Okay, let's see how well you did with this. So starting out with point A, this is going to be an area of destructive interference. Okay, point A there on the black ring. Remember, black is an area of destructive interference. And so that's point A. That means point B is going to be an area of constructive interference. It's right there with the light area, so it's going to be an area of constructive interference. Point C they're kind of in a boundary region, so it's going to be an area of partial interference. Point D is there. It's going to be a dark area that makes it destructive interference. Point E, another area of light, and so that's going to be constructive interference. So when you're looking at these interference patterns, just keep in mind, dark areas are areas of destructive interference. Light areas are areas of constructive interference. This brings us to Thomas Young. Thomas Young, English physician, uh, he's been described as the last man who knew everything because the man was insatiably curious. But like a lot of people that are really smart in the head, they don't always have the best uh, communication skills. And so he had trouble communicating a lot of the brilliant ideas that he had in his head. Nonetheless, that didn't hold him back from making significant contributions in many fields of study. So his Young's modulus, which is used by engineers, uh, we're looking at the relationship between stress and strain in a material. We use this in designing practically everything. So anything that has any sort of mechanical design to it, you're going to be using Young's modulus. And it was an engineering breakthrough from its day. Uh, it's something that's so common it's really taken for granted today. But when it first came out, 
uh, from Thomas Young. Wow, what a breakthrough that was because it enables us to design uh, for the mechanical forces that are acting on an object. Young was also the first to describe astigmatism, and his work foreshadowed the modern understanding of color vision. Uh, he showed how surface tension in liquids explains capillary action. So if you've ever seen uh, you know, any type of liquid inside a tube, and if you look at the surface of the liquid inside the tube, it, 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 it's kind of like hugging, and it kind of crawls up a little bit on the sides of the, of the tube. Uh, that's what we call capillary action. And uh, Young showed how that uh, is, is explained by surface tension. So tension there on the surface of the liquid is what's pulling uh, the liquid up there on the sides of the capillary, which is what they call really a small, thin tube. Uh, he basically devised a rule of thumb for giving doses of medicine to, ch to children, uh, which actually turned out to be very useful. Uh, he also contributed to deciphering the Rosetta Stone. So the Rosetta Stone, for those who don't know, uh, it allows us, this is the key that allows us to understand and translate ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. Before the Rosetta Stone, you know, archaeologists that would look at ancient Egyptian writing, they would see these hieroglyphs and they had no clue, you know, what these symbols are signifying in reality. So, of course, we can't, we can't read it. What makes the Rosetta Stone great is that it is basically a document they're carved in stone, but it's in multiple languages. So you've got Egyptian hieroglyphs, but you've also got ancient Greek. Well, we can translate the ancient Greek, and so using our knowledge of ancient Greek, then we can actually correlate that with the Egyptian hieroglyphs, and that allows us to give us a key to understanding ancient Egyptian. Now, Notice I said he contributed significantly. This is actually a controversial issue because there was a Frenchman at the time who also was doing work with the Rosetta Stone and who some credit as unlocking the key to deciphering ancient Egyptian. So what's really funny is some years back, you know, you had the British Museum in London. They had a special display on the Rosetta Stone. And so... You know, one week they, they'd have like pictures of Thomas Young and this French dude and they would they would put them out there. And it was really funny is that, you know, they had all kinds of people coming in to see the exhibit. Well, the people that were British were complaining to the management of the museum because they thought that the picture of the French dude was bigger than the picture of Young. Well, there are a lot of people coming in from France to see the exhibit, and all the French visitors were saying the exact opposite, that the picture of Young was bigger than the picture of the Frenchman, and therefore, you know, you've got to, you've got to fix this. But when you take a you know, ruler and measure out the pictures, they're exactly the same size. So a lot of you know, perception here, the controversy of who really was the guy that gave us the key, still controversial today. Nonetheless, it cannot be doubted that Thomas Young produced a lot of, um, you know, really great contributions in many fields. His curiosity was all over the place. Well, Thomas Young did some work with light, and he's probably most famous out of all the things that he's done for his double slit experiment. And this established uh, the wave theory of light. It's perhaps his greatest contribution to science. So this occurred in 1801. And basically, he uh, had uh, slits, slits in a, in a, I guess, a medium like cardboard or whatnot. And uh, he first showed the patterns in water. Okay, so he said, yeah. So we got these interference patterns in water. We can do the same thing with light. So he basically shines light through two closely spaced pinholes, and then the resulting. Uh, that light comes through, okay, because the aperture is small with respect to the wavelength of the light. So the light actually gets diffracted, and you see these patterns of brightness and darkness there as the image is formed on the other side. So 
the bright areas are coming from areas of constructive uh, interference where the waveforms that hit that spot okay from each of the slits or the pinholes they're actually converging together and they meet there and they're in phase and that produces reinforcement which gives us a bright area on the flip side if the waveforms from each of those slits or pinholes are 180 degrees out of phase then you get cancellation you get total destructive interference and that's what produces the dark area so here we've got a video and hopefully i can get this to work right here whoop go back i want the video there we go okay let's check this out and uh push play and let's check out this video What is light? What is light? Light's, what, light's, what, what is light? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? What is light? <laughs> <laughs> isn't it an element? Um, light is brightness, I guess. We have auras. We all have auras. Which are light? <laughs> yes, they are. It, it lights up the room. It makes it not dark. What's the difference between blue light and red light? The color. It goes in your eyes and then you see stuff. They range from white to red to orange to green. It's like the chakras of your body. Can you see my aura? Uh, no, not particularly right now. Is it too bright out? It's very sunny out here today. Does that make it harder to see someone's aura? Mm, not necessarily. If I was to explain it to a blind person, <laughs> right? Yeah. It would be it would be the difference. Uh, you see nothing whatsoever as a blind person, whereas I see things in front of me. To be fair, the question of what light is is not an easy one. For centuries, the greatest minds in science debated this issue. In the late 1600s, Newton proposed that light was a stream of particles, or corpuscles. He proposed this in his treatise Optics. But at the same time, a Dutch physicist named Huygens proposed that light was a wave. And this debate raged on until it was settled by the experiment I've recreated today, Thomas Young's double slit experiment. To make sure I got the experiment right, I went to the original source. With the help of Brady Heron, I managed to get into the vault underneath the Royal Society in London. In? There I found Thomas Young's handwritten notes from 1803. I brought a, into the sunbeam a slip, a slip of a card, card, about one thirtieth of an inch in breadth, and observed its shadow, either on the wall or on other cards held at different distances. Besides the fringes of colours on each side of the shadow, the shadow itself was divided by similar parallel fringes of smaller dimensions. Wow. This is an experiment so simple that you could make it at home, and yet so fiddly that I have never seen it before done with sunlight. I was thinking about doing it in a box, like a, like a fridge box. And you could take it out on the street. Taking it out on the street. Could I possibly interview you guys for about a minute? Sure. We're doing a science experiment. What I have here is an empty box. Mm -hmm. And this is a little eyepiece where we can look in, and this is a hole. And I'm gonna place this slide above that hole. And if you look closely, you'll see that there's two openings very yep. narrow opening side by side. It's a double slit. Now before we have a look, we need to tilt it towards the sun a little bit. So mm -hmm. we want the sun to hit this double slit directly. What are we going to see on the bottom well, of the box? The obvious thing you, you think you're going to see is you're going to see two, two lines. Two lines on the bottom of the box. Two bright bands. Two little lines. Yeah. yeah. I think it'll be one, one line instead of two. I could expect to see the whole box lit up. It'll probably be a kaleidoscope of some sort. A bunch of colors. Bunch probably, of yeah. Rainbow, different colors. There, have a look. You expected to see kind of one line. Is that what you see? No. I see dots. How many? It's one circle. Well, there's one, there's one in the middle strongest, two either side. And the two on the outside are multicolored, and the one in the middle is just white. It's kind of a rainbow. The rainbow of color as well. Quite a few colors and lots of little dots. Like there are more dots appearing. I think I can even see more dots spreading along. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I can see tons of dots now. Not tons, but I can see dots spreading across uh, that way. Either side. Yeah, definitely. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's incredible. And that's just nothing else apart from... Two slits. Two slits. That's incredible. But all we're doing is we're putting a light through two very narrow slits side by side. So how does this make any sense? 
there's some kind of principle involved there that the average person is not familiar with. That's the only explanation. No, I'm really confused by it, but I'd like to find out why. People were debating, is light a wave or is it made of particles? So what causes that? Well, if light were behaving as particles, you would expect them to go through each slit and just produce a bright spot underneath. So we would see two bright spots on the bottom of the box. But if light's behaving as waves, then the wave from one slit can interact with the waves from the other slit. I've got a demonstration here on a little pond where we can see this with water waves. I have two sources of ripples, which are basically like the two slits. When I create ripples with a single source, they travel out with circular wave fronts. Nothing particularly surprising there. But if I add a second source of ripples, then we start getting an interesting pattern. This pattern is created by the ripples from the two sources interacting with each other. Where they meet up peaks with peaks and troughs with troughs, the amplitude of the wave is increased. That's what we call constructive interference. But if the peak from one wave meets up with the trough from the other, then we get destructive interference and there's basically no wave there. And this is exactly what was happening with the light. When the light from one slit met up peaks with peaks and troughs with troughs, they constructively interfered and produced a bright spot. But if the trough from the wave from one slit met up with the peak of the wave from the other slit, they would destructively interfere and you wouldn't see any light there. It's light cancelling itself out. This is basically the same as like having two drops of water fall in a swimming pool. That's right. Get exactly the same pattern. And then pattern. they go and overlap. As this ripple over, overlaps with those ripples, yeah. down the bottom, you get a series of, you get like a bright spot, and then a dark spot, and then a bright spot, then yep, a dark yep. spot, then a bright spot. Now there's a slight complication, which is that sunlight is composed of many different colors, and they have different wavelengths. So obviously they're going to meet up at slightly different points. And that's what caused the rainbowing effects as we go further from the central maximum. So you saw the ones to the right were slightly colored. Yeah, that's it's because time to go the reds are going to meet up at different places than the blues. And that's all that makes the color differences is different wavelengths. Exactly. That's amazing. So the difference between so the, red so and blue. So that red bin over there and the green, yeah. the green part is just, I'm, I'm seeing it's that a different, it's just different, different wavelengths. Length. And that's how we bring in all these beautiful colors all around us. Exactly. That's amazing. I'm, I'm amazed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good on you. Thanks, Ben. Hey, thank you. I have been enlightened, literally. <laughs> <laughs>
This is polarized light. And only 50% of the original light is transmitted through. So half of it actually gets canceled out when we took out all of these different uh, planes of light that the uh, light is actually vibrating uh, through with the waveform. Think of this like a, like a picket fence analogy. So if you've got, say, a rope that you're looking at through two picket fences, you can actually make a waveform that will travel through each of those picket fences because the filters are basically aligned up with each other so the waveform can actually go through. So we see the same thing here. If you put polarized light and you put it together, okay, that's basically what we're doing with the Polaroid. We're actually taking it and filtering out everything except for one plane, the one plane that can actually go through the filters. But let's say, you know, we flip over that second fence there. So now the waveform has actually stopped. We see the same thing with Polaroids, okay? If we flip the one, one fill ultra, so now still the, the, the Polaroids are actually what we call crossed. So now none of the light is able to get through because the one plane that was actually going through the filter uh, for the first filter is actually stopped by the second filter. So we can see the same thing with Polaroids. If we align the axis, the light is going to be transmitted through. When we flip one over 90 degrees, now the axes are crossed. No light gets transmitted through. If we go halfway between, okay, so now we've got a third polarizer going halfway in between. So now we get some of the light is able to go through. Uh, so it's actually a, a mix between the two extremes that we see where the axes are aligned or crossed. And this is basically the way polarizers work. They're filtering out different directions of light. We get the same uh, effect from light that's reflected from different surfaces. So if you're looking at a metallic surface, the light that's reflected is not polarized. So the light's going to come in and it's going to get reflected off. Uh, you know, the, the reflected light's going to vibrate in many different directions. So if we're looking at a non-metallic surface, on the other hand, much of that light will be polarized. So the light's going to come in, but then when it reflects back off, it's polarized because it's only vibrating, that waveform is only vibrating along one single plane. And notice that that plane is going to be parallel to the surface that the light's reflected from. So if you're looking at a horizontal surface, the light that's coming off of it is going to be horizontal. If you're looking at a vertical surface, the light that's reflected will be vertical. So with that in mind, which pair of glasses do you think is best suited for automobile drivers? The polarization axes are shown by straight lines. So these are the lines that are going to get uh, uh, basically, uh, this is, these are the lights. This is what light is going to come through the, the filter there. So the first pair that you see there with part A, it's going to let in a light that's uh, vibrating along a vertical plane. B is going to let in light that's vibrating along a horizontal plane. And then C, you've got one lens of each. So which of these lenses do you think is best suited for automobile drivers? Yeah, this is the point where I want you to actually make a selection. Go ahead and make your pick. Okay, well, I hope what you picked was pair A. It's best for driving. Okay, so the vertical axes are going to allow vertical light to pass, and that's what we want, because the glare that's coming off of the road, what type of material is the road? Well, it's not metallic. It's non-metallic. Non-metallic surfaces, the light reflected is going to be polaroid, uh, polarized uh, along a horizontal plane because that's parallel with the surface. So the glare coming off the road is going to be parallel with the surface of the road and that's going to be the horizontal direction so you want to block out the horizontal direction let in the vertical direction so that's why pair a is going to be best for driving and that brings us to the end of this video hope you found it helpful thanks for watching and we will see you in the next video